nonlinear dynamic between sight, gesture, staging, and recording. She integrates elements of performance, film, drawing, and installation. Hannah lives and works in London, but that might change soon. She might be moving to Vancouver. She's scouting it out. Um, and she has also held solo exhibitions at Modern Art Oxford, the Fogo Island Gallery, Newfoundland Art Speak, the Whitechapel Gallery, and the, show, the Showroom Gallery in London. Her work has been included in group exhibitions at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Palais de Tokyo with De With, and she was included in the recent Hayward Gallery Touring Exhibition, Listening. She received the Max Mara Art Prize for Women in 2008, and in 2015, she was awarded the Philip Leverhulme Prize in Visual and Performing Arts. She is also a lecturer at the Fine Art um, a lecturer in fine art at Central St. Martin's London. She also does not mind the rain. So if you, <laughs> could, you could uh, join me in welcoming Hannah. Hey, uh, it's really good to be here. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, I often at the beginning of talks, I think, it's a bit quick to just go kind of straight into the work, and so I'm trying something out this time, which is just to talk quickly about like two or three images that are kind of maybe they sort of I mean they do in some way exist within the kind of constellation of the work, but they're not specifically um, the work itself. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is this. This is a dry canter, which is a, a form of ventifact. Uh, ventifacts are objects which are made by the wind. So uh, a rock which is in the same place for a long time, as most rocks are, um, if it's in a, like a dry place with wind in a relatively consistent direction, will be kind of abraded by the sand that's blown by the wind. And eventually, a kind of uneven rock would have one edge sanded off it, at which point the center of gravity moves and the rock tips forward, and then the same thing repeats again over thousands of years until it tips again. Um, and this is, although it looks like an object that's like arrived from space or like some kind of carved sculpture, is made by the wind. Um, and every time I look at it, I kind of can't quite believe it, but it's this kind of, uh, yeah, these rocks that you can, you can read the direction the wind was blowing in, like in the last ice age, by looking at these rocks. Anyway, so that's one. Um, these are pieces of fulgurite. Um, fulgurite is uh, made when lightning hits sand. Um, so, uh, if it's hitting like a sand, which is a kind of silicon, silicate-based sand, um, then essentially, like the heat fuses that sand into a form of glass, essentially. These are kind of glass objects that are made by lightning. These two are actually from a, uh, a, piece, a couple of pieces that I have collected uh, from this uh, from a lightning strike that happened in upstate New York in 2008. Um, these two don't have it, but I have another piece from the same strike, um, uh, which hit the road, it hit like between the road and the pavement, I always get confused in North America because pavements are not the, like the sidewalk. Okay, so between the road and the sidewalk, there was like an area of, I guess, sort of infill with grass over it that had um, some, you know, whatever, a bunch of rocks and junk underneath. And the piece that I have that's not in this image, um, there must have been pieces of blue and white china that were buried in that kind of gravelly sand because it has fused into it this like blue and white section. Like about the image that isn't here, but so again, yeah, this is a full view right. Um, this is a diagram that I found recently in the Natural Resources Library on Robson. There's this kind of amazing geology library on the 15th floor where you can go through lots of geological stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's a diagram that shows uh, it's from a study uh, about the acoustic measurements of sediment transport. It's an Environment Canada Journal from 1976. Uh, but it is something that I'm trying to figure out about it, or I think I, I, I love the structure of this kind of analysis of the sound of a river, essentially. Like all of the kind of like breaking it down into like what could be making sound within this environment uh, in something that otherwise would be very hard to kind of break down into 
what's causing what sound. Um, it feels kind of like it's really exact. Um, this is a stack of steel shingles, but more on that in a second. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about two pieces of work, um, which kind of sit together somehow, or kind of like have a very definite, I don't know if they're like cousins or siblings or whatever, but they, 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 they relate quite closely together. Um, the first work is uh, a piece called Grey Light, Left and Right Back, High Up Two Small Windows, which I made uh, as the result of a series of residencies on Fogo Island, called Fogo Island Arts, um, over a number of years, and was shown in the Fogo Island Gallery in 2014. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of installation shots of it and then show you an extract of it. Um, so this is an installation shop in the gallery. Um, it's a two-screen sync video work with seven channels of sound. Um, in the room also, uh, there are four sets of acoustic panels. Um, the, the image that shows them a bit more clear in a minute. Um, the work itself is in, it's in six movements. There's also a print uh, that you can see there on the left. Um, and the projectors there are stacked on that's you see the change on that to follow. Um, yeah, so it's shot, it's, it's on two screens. One of the screens was uh, recorded in a community hall in Selden, which is a community of Fogo Island. Uh, oh, Fogo Island is um, in Newfoundland. Fogo Island is off the, the kind of central eastern coast of Newfoundland. Thank you for reminding me. And I've spent, I've been there six times now. It's, it's sort of become a kind of, uh, when I'm not there, it's like a memory palace for me to think into somehow. It's, it's sort of where I go to think about work when I can. Um, so this is the gallery. Uh, Fogo Island is a kind of residency-based contemporary art organization. Uh, that also uh, produce exhibitions within the Fogo Island Gallery, which is in the Fogo Island Inn, um, and they produce publications uh, and events and exhibitions in other places other than Fogo Island around North America and the rest of the world. Um, okay, uh, this is another shot. It shows more clearly those uh, the acoustic panels there. The acoustic panels are uh, dimensions of Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings. Um, so there's four sets um, that kind of, in, in, in dimensions at least, kind of reproduce those white paintings that uh, Cage talked about as uh, helping him make 4 minutes 33 and describe them as like airports for shadows and dust. Okay, I'm going to turn out of this.
whenever I'm making this work, I'm trying to, um, I guess, balance out uh, a number of elements within the work, which always means when I come to talk about it, I feel slightly reticent to start in one place because it sort of leads you through how the sort of what of these various kind of like um, things that come together, sort of like you use one, then you pick it up and you look at the rest of it through it, but inevitably it's what kind of time works. Um, but yeah, so uh, I guess in useful, or, or the kind of a beginning, a sort of originating story, if you like, for how this work began for me, which is also, it might be something that didn't really happen, um, but it was very useful as an image. Um, before I first went to Fogo Island, and I went there first in 2011, um, I'd been uh, installing some work in a gallery in in the Orkney Islands, which are just north of Scotland. Um, and somebody was talking to me there about uh, an island that they knew of in Scotland um, where it was so often foggy that, um, and that, that they had a fog horn there, obviously, because it's a very foggy place. And it was so often foggy that the people in the community would pause in their speech before the fog horn went off and then begin to speak again after it had sounded. Um, and I sort of like emailed him afterwards and I was like, where was this? And he was like, oh, I'm not sure, I don't know, I read it, I can't remember, you know, it was this kind of, um, this, this, this image that sort of didn't necessarily have a home, but then I, it was something that really stuck with me because it's a, it's, it's a sound that tells you you can't see that's embedded into language. Um, or in that, within that tale, what is proposed is that sound that tells you you can't see becomes embedded somehow in the language. And I was thinking about it when I got to Fogo Island and um, Newfoundland's a foggy place. Uh, there's, there's like particular weather conditions. Um, you know, there's, there is a fog one on Fogo Island, um, which features in the work. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's, it's somewhere where this kind of um, there's something very horizontal about the island itself because it's the highest point on the island is only 100 meters above sea level. But something to do with um, the way that visibility plays out because of atmospheric conditions is very particular and was something that kind of was um, going on in the work. So um, the, I, I found this community hall, uh, which is in Selden, in, in, on Fogo Island, which is the nearest community hall to the point on the island where the fog one is. Um, and it's the only community hall from within, within which you could hear the fog on it, uh, if it were going. Um, so this, this kind of meeting space where people meet to discuss things uh, that are of importance in, in the community or meet to have a christening or a bingo or whatever, all of these things. Um, yeah, it could be reached by the sound. Um, uh, and that kind of had a, I guess, a, there's a legacy on Fogo Island of, of um, uh, these films that were made. Uh, I'm just going to skip through to show you. Wait. Um, there's a legacy on Fogo Island of a series of films that were made in the late 60s by the NFB as part of the Challenge and Change program, which was a really amazingly interesting uh, program of films made between the late 60s and the late 70s, early 80s, I'm not sure. Um, and it became known as the Fogo Process, but it was a series of films that were made on Fogo Island at the time when um, Fogo Island was in, in kind of imminent danger of being resettled. Um, as these outdoor communities in Newfoundland, pressure was put on them to move to larger centers of population where the government could provide them the services that they were obligated to. And Fogo Island didn't want to move. Um, and uh, as this was all playing out, it was also during the collapse of the cod fisheries and the kind of usual sources of income was drying up, people were wondering what to do. Um, this, this series of films were made, and it was made by the NFP with Memorial University in St. John's and a series of uh, Colin Lowe, a filmmaker with a team came and made films in the communities uh, about the problems of the communities uh, and how they could organize and how they could uh, 
One of the films shows the fishing port in Cannes, which this year is 50 years old. Um, this, this still is from, a, it's called the Fogo Island Improvement Committee. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, films that kind of show these discussions happening in community halls. Not, not the community hall in Selden, but other community halls. Um, mainly by bunches of men talking in rooms, it has to be said. But, um, but there, there, there's a kind of process in which this place that, in the, you know, in the 60s, Fogo Island didn't have, it didn't have roads, it was like, you know, the, it was like, relatively speaking, was kind of like living in the 19th century in some ways. Um, so it was kind of this first moment of um, Fogo Island being able to present an image of itself outside um, of the island, um, and to kind of form that image of itself. Um, and the gestures uh, that I worked with the two performers that you see in, in, the, in the, this, the screen that was on this side, two performers, uh, we, we sort of found and developed a, like a vocabulary gesture, all of which came from those films. So as they sit at tables and they talk and they listen, uh, everything, the, the way that they'd be moving their things around on the table, that, that was the kind of source the source book for all of the kind of actions that the, that the two performers made. And that was partly also because in those films when you see these meetings, uh, the camera is more often than not, it's looking at the people listening, not the person speaking. Um, when I, that really struck me the first time I saw these films because it, it was, uh, they were kind of instructional. The film itself was telling me what to do, which was to listen. And so I took the films as an instruction uh, to listen uh, on Fogo Island and to kind of perceive it through an act of listening. Um, so the, the, the hall itself is, um, uh, it, we set up a track from Dolly through the space. In this, over the six movements, in the one that I showed you, you see the ceiling. So. Um, uh, what you're seeing here is, is, is the track with, with the camera pointing directly up at the ceiling and it uh, points that way all the way through. There are other shots that kind of move across the space under the tables or kind of uh, on, along the wall. Um, each one is kind of sliced that also kind of functions like a, I mean particularly with these ones that show the lights on the ceiling, I really thought from as almost like a sort of play a piano roll or something. It's like looking at like a common that carol score or something, whatever, these kind of, if they are themselves a kind of um, a score. And the building itself is, um, this is where the cedar shapes come in, the, big, the building itself is totally functional and does all the things it needs to do. Um, but the floors are long and the lights are up a bit, you know, they're not in line. You probably notice like as, the, the, as you track through, the, you know, have one coming in earlier or later or whatever, or the slight angles. And that kind of, that like functionality, but kind of like offness, really became kind of important to me. And the floor itself is a kind of like a sort of mini mountain range, which when you're trying to lay down a trap is not super easy. <laughs> but there was this moment at the beginning of making the work where there's a wonderful kind of technician and person who works at Fogwan Darts, used to be a fisherman, now kind of my Fogo Island dad, Cyril Lynch, um, and when we started to lay the tracks out in the hall, um, Cyril just turned up with that bundle of cedar shapes as this material that would go between the floor and the track. And it was like this, it was at, at that moment, like so much in the work changed for me. It was this like really kind of like, dense moment where Cyril just like had this material that was perfect to do the thing that it needed to do, but it was also, I don't know, it, it, it was like to do with function and like use and solving a problem and all of this stuff. And then uh, what pleased me is that the cedar then has a, it's like a character in the sound. As the cedar would dry out as the track, as the dolly ran along the track, it's heavy, like when it got to like where the cedar was, um, over the course of we were shooting for like several days a week, you'd hear the pops and cracks of the scene as well. Um, so it sort of became this like new, this line or this kind of voice within the sounds that you're hearing. All of the sounds you heard are, we had um, 
one microphone pointing to the hotwire foghorn. We got permission from the Canadian Coast Guard to uh, put the foghorn on for when we were shooting, which is very easy to just put a board over the window. Um, but somebody had to like, climb a fence and put the board up. Um, but we, yeah, we had to do some negotiating about that. Um, you hear um, an air vent that clacks on the back of the building, which is kind of, it's not exposed directly to the wind, but as the air pressure changes around it, it sort of clacks away. And then all of the kind of dense ticking and clicking. Um, other radiators coming on. So the, each of the sounds that is kind of most present is like, in some way relates to like what's happening outside of the space, be it the temperature outside, will be making the, the heaters inside function in one way or another, the air pressure changing, the visibility, although that obviously within the kind of production of the work was had to be slightly hot oh boy. But um, but yes, there's a um, these 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 indicators of 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 what is beyond the room um, are present in the sounds. Um, I realised that I maybe should hurry up talking about this one and then move on to the next one. Um, so anyway, the print that hangs in the, in the gallery space is, and that also you see, okay, this reminds me, I have to talk about this, I'm always catching all these things. Uh, the uh, piece of paper that uh, the performers are working with there, the two things they're working with on the table are um, images of the floor in the hall, so photographic images of the, the floor tiles in the hall that have various markings on them have these black lines drawn on them. That was on the floor in the hall. There were all these kind of strange things that were kind of, these, these elements of drawing which really feature in the work as well. Um, but anyway, so they, they, they are moving around images of the floor and then these smaller pieces of paper have basically um, this on them. So uh, there are certain points, for example, when Ted's working with the paper this time and that kind of clicking sound happens, that almost, uh, there's, the film is being made, there's like a paper version of the film happening in one screen as, the, uh, um, as, as what's happening in the other screen is going on. They had earpieces in, and so when we shot in London, they were listening through earpieces to the sounds of the hall, and they had a monitor that is out of shot that they could kind of look up to to see what was happening in that. Um, but there, they're, they're working with as a kind of organizing principle and in reaction to the sounds that they're hearing. Um, and then those two things are kind of synced together. So sometimes there are these kind of questions about like the sort of causation of like who is making what happen or which way around are these rooms, like what's leading what somehow. Um, yeah. Um, so. That's just another shot of the, uh, that's like a kind of clearer shot of the acoustic panels. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, the other piece of work I'd like to talk about is a piece that I, I finished several months ago. It's just finished, it hasn't been anywhere yet, but it's, uh, it's done. Um, and it's a piece called One Can Make Out the Surface Only by Placing a Dark Colored Object on the Ground. Um, it's, uh, it's a piece I've made, um, I shot at, and worked at, on through a, a production residency at the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, MPAC, uh, which is in upstate New York, uh, in a town called Troy. Um, I'm, I'm just going to play you a bit first.
so uh, this piece is a it's just probably it's just over 40 minutes long, um, uh, and it appears to be a single continuous shot. Um, the uh, Hitchcock road trip looks even better on this projector than because <laughs> it completely. Um, but yeah, so there's a moment in the middle where because uh, it was too difficult to shoot these two 20-minute sections as one 40-minute section. For the performers, technically, for everyone, it was too high a risk to, you know, get to 39 minutes and something to happen. Um, but so yes, it's a 40-minute it's a continuous shot. And it was shot, um, you can see the room a bit better, because that's a lot around the performers. You can see uh, this space, which is this incredible um, performance space at MPEG. Um, which is kind of in a way it's the sort of opposite of the four of vocal line and lots of ways very machine, very straight. But it's also entirely acoustically sealed from everywhere else in the building. It's built as a building within a building, so it's like on whatever, like rubber suspension or all of the things around it, which means it's completely there's no sounds from the outside. Nothing gets into this space, no sounds get into the space. Um, what you hear uh, are all the sounds that are made while the work is being made. So um, the kind of the drumming, the paint, whatever, all of those clicks are made by the, these, uh, this, cable, this cable mechanism that I was working on, which they really wanted to fix the click on, and I told them, please don't do that. In the same way, I said, please don't make a floor. Um, because like, that's, yeah, the first, the first time I was there on a production residency and I saw this, this system being operated and heard that click, when I then went to sort of work on the camera movements, they wanted to fix it. And I said, please don't, because that kind of texture was really so cute. I was looking for. So again, yeah, this is what the, um, this is the beautiful rig that MPAC built, the second iteration of the rig. <laughs> um, and so we're shooting, uh, yeah, uh, on this rig that could be, it's basically it can move to almost any point within the volume of the space. And originally that was something that, um, and that kind of plays out the work was very important to me. I really, uh, I, I really like the idea of being able to be in this like aerial position, looking down at this kind of distribution of images, and then to be able to like go from this aerial shot like through a gesture to an image on the floor, so that the, the like the, the 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 thing capturing the images can kind of move through these states. Um, so. Uh, um, the kind of question you can see slightly for a second, just how um, everything is very documented in MPEG. So if you do anything, then you just come away with like a giant hard drive with like pictures of people taking pictures. Um, and so this is a kind of this you can kind of see the setup in the room, the performers, the same performers that are in grey light. Um, uh, Again, have their pieces in, but this time through which they can hear me queuing them up to certain things. And I'm in that room up there. You see where there's a monitor? There's a kind of glass cage to the side of that, and that's the kind of control room in which uh, the DMP was working, the, somebody was pulling focus, the uh, person was flying the rig, um, and then I were up in that space. Um, so we, within the kind of 40 minutes, there's a kind of continuous distribution of these images. Two performers are working with, um, with this kind of, I, I guess, it's this selection of images that I collected over a period of time, which, um, I mean, they come from various sources. Many of them, I'm just going to move this curtain a bit, Russell. Uh, they, they're kind of, there's, there's a kind of, um, some kind of sensibility to them, and then other kind of outliers that in some way relate to it. But a lot of them are um, images of um, Arctic surfaces, of surfaces of, of sea ice, or surfaces of, uh, this is actually the path of a balloon, an attempted balloon flight to the North Pole in the very, now I can't remember if it was like the eight, 1897 or 1903 or something, but like around the turn of the century, and there was a, a, a Swedish explorer called Salman Andre, who attempted to uh, uh, fly this balloon to the North Pole. Um, and it was this kind of uh, 
uh, I mean, in all the images, obviously, it's in black and white, but it was this kind of dark shape that as, as they left, something went wrong, and so they never flew in the way they wanted to. Essentially, they would kind of fly for a bit and then, like, land and then fly and be dragged along the ice and land. So it was this kind of, this journey that was, like, being marked, like this kind of, like, dark object dropping down off the sea ice, picking itself up, dropping down again. Um, so there are images like that. There are a lot of kind of geological uh, images which um, I have a, a growing collection of images, geological images which have an object in them for scale. So you often in like geology handbooks you'll have a piece of rock and there's like a hammer or a watch or a backpack or something in there to kind of show the sort of, there's a lot about this kind of shifting scales in this work. Uh, but yeah, so these objects, these, these images that kind of have this kind of image of scale in, that suddenly kind of pin you down to a, a kind of human intervention in a landscape scale. The title of, maybe this is a good time, the title of the work came from a kind of description of how to navigate in whiteout conditions. So in this, um, in an undifferentiated space, uh, where it's hard to tell where things are or where the horizon is, that there's a, a, a method of moving, which is just to do with like putting down a dark object, moving towards it, and doing that. And that really, that sentence felt like what you do when you just like sit down and put a piece of paper. It could be like composing, it could be writing, it could be anything. It's this like you have to put something down and then you have to pick it up again and put something else down. It's like it, it's a kind of it, it's it's in a way it's like a a, a sentence that describes a physical act, but it's describing a process of thought. Um, it's describing a process of kind of picking thoughts up and putting them back down again, which is a lot to do with how I was directing the performance as well. In a way, I, the, the performers almost were given a kind of meditation instruction for me. But it was like, when you realize that you're doing something, then that's when you stop doing it, and you put it down, and you move on. Um, so, um, yeah, good digression. Uh, some of the other images of these very early glass plate negatives of the Northern Lights, um, which have in them obviously these kind of like they're held down by coins and they're cracked and, and, and obviously these are the kind of negatives of it. You can see in here this is a kind of way of um, traversing into like the, the way that the cameras move. You can see in here certain shapes, like that kind of strange uh, shape at the bottom of the lower one and this kind of swoosh here. And then you can see that I was taking shapes that are from the images that the performers are working with, taking vectors from those images to be the path that the camera moved along. Um, so you can recognize there's that shape there, and there's that swoosh that's there. The, uh, the second shape in on the left-hand side is the path of that balloon. The black diamond that I showed a bit earlier on, which is actually what, an image of what you get if you search for a black tarpaulin on the Staples website. It's just like there is a tarpaulin laid out on the ground, but it became this kind of placeholder, not supposed. Um, yeah, so these then, these shapes that I took from the images, I started to, what well, they became the kind of the basis for how the camera moved. This didn't work so well for the, um, Eric, the guy who was flying, the rig, so he turned it into this. Um, so, so we like we, we programmed all of those shapes into uh, this, which actually then became like the basis on which we all worked. So I had a folder with this, and I would note up. Uh, there were 16 pages of the script, and I would say to the performers, "Okay, we're now in page six, and you have a cue in here to do this, and I'll talk you into this point." Um, Eric was using it. Ryan, the, the camera operator, had stuff marked up, um, and so we all use this version of it as a kind of working document. Um, these, are, these are some of the, both like it within the same book of those glass plate images, these are the, the, the images themselves. And you can now see, having seen that image of the room, that also these relate to the, the acoustic tiles which are all over the walls at MPAC, and um, each one of those acoustic tiles is drilled differently. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, I, uh, this is a, a moment in the work that uh, you didn't see, but um, in this we were, again, kind of thinking about how we would develop kind of ways of moving with the performers. Um, they were often identifying points within 
these, because you see like there's constellations of stars in there. Um, these were all these images were taken in pairs because they were trying to get this kind of parallax view to sort of find the distance of the modern light. Um, but they were using those points. So within uh, these moments within the work, you see this, this sort of gestures that are made that are kind of that we work through this kind of process of improvisation. And then finally, within those improvisations, these kind of like choreographed moments that would be retained in the work. Um, so again, also in the sort of, I'm just going to flip back and forth between these two images, because that kind of sense of a lot of the images are, um, they're like on the edge, they are of something, but they're on the edge of representation. They really kind of become quite abstract in a way. Um, uh, like a smudge or something, you know, and so we're working also with some of, particularly with these glass negative ones, in how also the reflection of images on the floor functions. So this is a still from that section from that you watched where Ted is walking away from the camera and you see these kind of like reflections of the image in the ground. Um, so that was something that also became very important in the work and um, yeah, kind of draws out also the different textures of the floor, uh, which was maybe not so easy for you to see, um, but the floor is kind of like scratched up by other performances which have happened there. You know, there's like footmarks and whatever, there's like little patches of scratches or whatever. So the, the floor itself, uh, yeah, kind of has all these kind of like marks on it that relate to the content of some of the imagery as well. Um, yeah. So maybe now is a good time for questions. I think we hit the hit time there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Hey. So how did you start it? spending a lot of time on Fogo Island, which is a very, uh, it's like parts of the island are very barren. There are all these glacial erratic rocks which are distributed around as the last ice age receded. These kind of rocks that are just, which I'm still really interested in and trying to kind of figure things out about. They just are left as the ice, they drop out of the ice. Um, so it was partly that. And then also I did a residency um, through the Cambridge Earth Sciences Department um, with the Contemporary Art Society in London, so I spent a lot of time in the uh, sciences department, and that was like had its ups and downs. But the one thing I could do was just like sit and go through journals in the library, and I started also then going to the Scott Polo Research Institute in Cambridge, which is the most incredible library, um, which is organised by. Um, it's not organised by subject; it's organised by kind of place within each certain polar region. So you'll have like Greenland and you'll have like anthropology and geology and everything like within that section, then you go whatever these, you know, the different countries that form that kind of certain polar region. So it was through, yeah, it was through that kind of experience. Um, and uh, through reading amazing books like John McPhee's book, uh, which is called Annals of the Former World, which is this kind of five part book which kind of chronicles the geological history of North America. He, he writes, he's like a staff writer for the New Yorker, so it's like written in this way that's like very um, easy to read and understand, but also like very, like there's a lot of information. Yeah, so that was, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's called um, Annals of the Former World. So the, 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 the work has, as it is finished, it has these two forms that it can exist in, two, two different sound mixes. One, uh, which is the, the kind of, like, I guess the primary one would be for, for an installation version that has like seven channels of sound. Um, 
in which um, I guess like could happen on Fogo Island in, in the piece in grey light, one can then kind of like identify different sounds from different speakers. And it also, uh, there's this 5.1 kind of mix that can be shown in like film screenings and stuff. But anyway, within the kind of installation version um, of it, um, I would like to be able to, yeah, to work with some of these images as critics as well. Um, in your bio, mm -hmm. it says something about perception. Mm -hmm. I don't know if perception. <clears throat> but it seems like in a lot of these, you're interested in, uh, or these two words. Yeah. Well, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, but it seems like, but even some of the other ones that was out there about weather and mm -hmm. things that are not so human centered exactly. Mm -hmm. They're about the phenomena, they seem to engage with the phenomena around us that are produced sometimes unintentional, well, unintentional, yeah, unhuman. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you interested in perception? Yeah, and I, but I think it, it kind of going back to those kind of, I think the easiest way to locate it is in those kind of earlier works. Yeah. There's a piece I showed at Art Speak in 2010, which was composed from. Um, people's verbal descriptions of the sound they heard when they saw the northern lights. Um, and then the work I made after that was um, where I started to work with gesture more, but it was that was a work that was composed from people's descriptions of this mirage that happened across Lake Michigan. So then there are these like points where it's like um, Though both those things are things that not everybody has perceptual access to, in a sense, or even the people that were involved in telling me would maybe only have heard that sound once in their life or seen that image once in their life. So they couldn't go back to it and, and revisit it in some way or capture it in any other way. Those things existed in language. So the Northern Lights thing, it's not a sound, it's not something that can be recorded. Not everyone can hear it. So the descriptions become the material of the sound. Um, and sometimes in, though in that work, people are using things they couldn't have heard to describe a sound I haven't heard. So they would say, okay, so imagine there's a hundred people with wooden pencils tapping in on a desk. Or uh, you're hearing a car, but only the wheels. You know, like these kind of strange, like, or like, it's like fire crackles, but thousands of them are lower. There's this like, um, yeah, this imaginative space that's opened up by this kind of form of having to sort of, yeah, something being absent in that way. So those more directly deal with that. And I think, like, there's something else going on now that it sort of, it's sort of, like, it comes out of that, but, yeah. Mm. Hey. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for explaining in detail. It's still not clear because, in, in terms of the performance you kind of conduct that, Mm -hmm. I was wondering, because my producer degree is in geology, yeah. so I was wondering if you employ some sort of scientific approach to it, like studying it in a, a science aspect, mm -hmm. or is it kind of like more interpretation and then put it into like performance? Uh, it's interpretation. I mean, it's not, there's, there's the, like my, yeah, my handle on like geology is like, um, I mean, I think anybody's handle on geology is like getting into these like, again, maybe this is a thing that relates to what we're talking about. It's maybe it's more to do now with this like perception of time. It's like, um, the minute you start talking about geology, you're into this experience of time that you just like, is completely abstract, you know? Like, I can get my head just around the last ice age. Yeah. But like, but, but what about like any other rock that was formed? You know, like when you see him, you, you kind of start to understand that, you know, this was, you know, the Atlantic closed and opened twice, and there's bits of Newfoundland and Scotland, and bits of Scotland and Newfoundland, and all of, I mean, all of everything that one, the minute you kind of get into like these yeah. kind of geological things, it's just like, you know, there's no way of having a kind of embodied understanding of it at all. It's something very distant in some way. But I'm really interested in that kind of like how you then, like, what that attempt might be. Yeah. Because as you're saying, sometimes they are the level of us rather than in science because there's no way to prove them. Like, how the plates move around the fucking place or anything. It's just like, sometimes we believe that's how it, it went. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, there's so 
some, some samples that will be found later on in their itching I mean, plate tectonics is only something that's been like really less. I mean, like so post war, plate tectonics are post war, you know? Like, that's crazy to me, you know, yes. that, like, before that, but, but, you know. There's a really amazing uh, passage in one of those John McPhee books which talks about, like, it's sort of trying to sort of describe this process of how you might, like, unpick stuff, and it describes. Imagine if you were come to an attic, and in that attic there is like a piece of like Louis XVI furniture, and there's like an I IKEA sideboard, and there's like basically like all of these pieces of furniture from all these different places and different ages, and they're all in this attic, and you have to figure out like how they got there, and that's like what you know like when you find rocks in certain places, and you know that you know with the glacial erratic rocks they can figure out where they came from because like they'll be you know, a rock that shouldn't be, that doesn't feature anywhere in this particular place, which has been brought from, like, somewhere where you know that rock exists, which is, like, hundreds of miles away. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's this kind of, like, reverse engineering jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Um, so, I, as this was the, it was the, the great luxury of working again with the same people, um, allowed that to kind of develop. Um, and so, because I've worked with Ted and Kedra on the last, um, on the last piece, like to work with them again and to kind of ask them to do something like, like something that didn't have um, an originating source. They're not imitating like the movements of people in a film. Um, and so the process by which we did it is, I had this collection of images that um, we printed in various sizes, um, and initially we sort of met to discuss the images, and I sort of tried to sort of talk my way into what I was thinking about it, um, and yeah, I, I learned what I think by saying it, so it was very useful to sort of have this like, discussion with them, and looking at the images, and kind of articulating it to them. And then we went through these like stages of workshops where um, I would ask them to handle the paper, and they found different ways of handling and moving the paper around. But also from within the images, and some we tried different things and making sounds and doing, you know, they would be making like vocal sounds, whatever. We tried all of these different things out, and each of the rehearsals we shot um, in a way that I could then go through it and I could like chop that up and make kind of mega mix of. Of, uh, of, of that rehearsal, and then I bring that to the next one. And then we work with the images again, but we watch those things and we work from that, and then we do that again. And so by the time we got to NPAC, we had a weeks of like just under a week's rehearsal to kind of block everything out and cue when things would be happening, where we would be taking something specifically that had been repeated and rehearsed elsewhere, and where it was kind of a free form thing where they uh, could work from within like all of the things that they had learned to do with the paper and learned to do with the images over the course of time. And um, it's really, although it looks in, on some level like, you know, it's people moving paper around, they became really, um, they had to be very kind of present in terms of like, it felt almost like they were kind of at times being able to like read the currents in the room or something, you know? like. They had to be in a very open frame of mind. Both of those takes, the two takes that form the work are like first or second <coughs> takes of the day. They had to inhabit this like very fresh space where they would be able to realize that they were repeating themselves and they were getting hooked into something or they were kind of like acting something out rather than being in this process where there's a lightness to what they're doing. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Aesthetic side in that knowledge, but not in an empty way through a kind 
body presence. What is your uh, hope for gendering a different kind of view and viewing the viewer or a different missing or a different presence? Yes. I mean, not that you're controlling that. No, no, no. What, what, do you, what do you hope? I guess quite simply, you'll make like the beginning of my answer, but we'll go from there, is that what I want the works to do is to create a certain form of attention which has, um, which may, which, uh, which sustains in some way, like it's like a space for like the more detailed attention or an attention that isn't, um, it, an attention that's even visually got more to do with listening, if that makes sense. I, I actually feel that. Yeah, so it's like really that kind of, um, so that you can like, so you can watch how you listen. And, it, and, and in both of these works, I'd say that there are kind of like, very much at the beginnings of almost every piece of work I make, I'm dealing with like thinking about composers rather than visual artists. So I'd say like in this work, I was thinking about Morton Feldman. In the, in the previous work, it was much more a kind of direct iteration of kind of some of Cage's ideas. In previous works, I've worked very closely with Glengall's radio, contrapuntal radio forms. But I think Cage is a kind of consistent thought space for me, but it, there's some, so there's that, if you like, that kind of Cajun idea of kind of, um, yeah, of, of, of kind of the, you know, sounds coming from, in from, from, from wherever they're happening and being what they are. So how much of your influence is also classic? I, I, no, I don't. Oh, well, no. you would really Okay, well, I will write yeah, that, that down. Yeah, I this idea of, of, of being present, and that's why I wanted to kind of hear you speak about what you're hoping for in terms of engendering a different kind of listening mm -hmm. and viewing than the, than the actual viewer. Yeah. Um, because in terms of um, Cage, mm -hmm. his relationship to uh, Buddhism mm -hmm. and different kinds of being present, now I'm not talking um, in relation to your awareness of that quality of attention. Yeah. I mean, I happen to be experiencing your work. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry I didn't see that art speak show. I wish I had now. Um, but I, I sense that that might be something that I might. I have a meditation practice and uh, I'm a Buddhist. So, so yeah. I, I sense that I am really, I'm, I'm really quite kind of thrilled by uh, <laughs> what you're doing because there's so many parallels to the things I've been thinking about. Yeah. And uh, you use also the prosthetic devices It's like, you know, uh, a way to kind of embody mm -hmm. um, in a very distracted world. Mm -hmm. So using, it's, it's like using representation against itself, and using the prosthetic devices um, to focus the attention mm -hmm. and a different kind of listening, uh, which I find really inspiring. I think in terms of kind of prosthetic devices, we include in that like the paper, the yes. performance of the, the, the key reason I wanted to use the piece of paper to use paper full stop is because you can't drop a piece of paper on the floor in the same way twice. So in the whole process of the work happening, there isn't a sense in which you can totally, you right. can, you can, you, the, to a certain degree maybe, right. but you can't kind of foresee the way in which the paper will fall. Right. You can begin to tune in to how it might, right. but essentially, you know, we're dealing with these takes, like whatever happened, happened. Um, and uh, it was, yeah, I mean, that was very kind of present for me as a thought. It's just that, that, that the paper will do what it does. Yeah, I and that could always work against any form of um, patterning that might be happening, like a habituation of something yes, yes, with the yes. thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how intensely choreographed they are, too. I mean, that was really lovely to hear you speak about that, because I think when people think about improvisation, they think it's kind of like, oh, you just made it with it. Oh, yeah. It's like free jazz, or yeah. when people do bring improvisation into their practice uh, as a musician, mm -hmm. uh, as a player, as a dancer, um, you know, there's a misunderstanding of that. Yeah. And so that's a really great elaboration. I was just reading a really, um, a really interesting text, which is a discussion between the Mont Young and Morton Feldman about improvisation and this idea oh. that, like, you know, um, the, yeah, that somehow improvisation is kind of free. It's like improvisation is taking a vocabulary of things that you yes. know how to do and applying them in ways 
that are slightly less linear than they might otherwise be. It's not some like direct channel from like the creative god. It's like whoa, you know. It's like there's there's there are things that are in your experience, and you find you 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 gain a, a kind of fluency in being able to access them in ways which create something very novel. So, Great. So what what is that text? Um, I have a PDF of it on here. I'll just uh, okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely.